Hello, and welcome to Ipsa Dixit, a podcast on legal scholarship. I'm your host, Brian L. Fry, Spears Gilbert Associate Professor of Law at the University of Kentucky College of Law. My guests are Deborah Gearhart, Associate Professor of Law at the University of North Carolina School of Law, and John McClanahan, Professor of Practice at the University of Minnesota Law School. We will discuss their article, Owning Colors, which will be published in the Cardozo Law Review. So welcome to the podcast, Deborah and John. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So really fun and cool paper about sort of people's perception of color and how color generates meaning. But I wonder if you could start by talking about what kind of ownership you're you're addressing in the paper. In other words, how, how can you own a color and and what kind of ownership are you are you talking about here? Well, so this is such an interesting question, right? The idea of owning a color seems so odd when we see colors all around us everywhere, right? But in intellectual property law, there are all kinds of things that people own that end up being surprising. And one of those things can be colors. There are patents that people obtain on methods of creating certain colors. There, you can uh, there you can get copyright protection for a very simple color field painting, which is essentially a big canvas of all one color, and you can get trademark protection for simply associating a particular color with particular goods and services. And we just thought that was a really interesting thing to think about and study. And so here we are. Great. And, and, and my understanding is that the paper focuses primarily on the ownership of colors in a trademark context. What, 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 what drew you to thinking about color in the context of, of trademark protection? And why did you think that that was a particularly useful way of thinking about the ownership or control of the use of a particular color in a particular context? Well, uh, the Supreme Court years ago in 1995 decided a case called Qualitex in which it found that color alone, aside from any word or design element, could be protected as a trademark. And at the time, scholars seemed to think that this was a huge problem, that it had opened up floodgates to all kinds of crazy, unexpected things being trademarks and thought that this would be a real problem. And then recently, the Harvard Law Review published a terrific study uh, by a couple of my IP colleagues that talked about clutter, that this actually has become a huge problem in trademark law, that the registry is becoming so crowded. So just putting the two ideas together, we thought it would be really super interesting to take a look and see if colors had um, developed the same kinds of problems that words had developed. Mm. Mm. And and you open the paper with a discussion of what the kind of scholarly literature, especially kind of marketing literature, tells us about color and how color communicates meaning. How and why does that matter in a trademark context and, and thinking about sort of when and why trademark protection should extend to the use of a color in a particular context? Well, it's so interesting because colors can signal so many different types of meanings that one of the really initial questions that we thought needed to be asked was, given how ubiquitous color is in our environment and given how many different cultural understandings we have around color, even things as basic as flavors or scents, right, that we associate with particular colors, we just wondered whether it really... How, how do courts sort whether or not uh, those signals can ever become trademarks? And the courts and the United States Patent and Trademark Office have both found different ways of dealing with this question and different gatekeeping devices. And we we're just really curious to take a look and say and see how well that was working and whether courts in the USPTO were dealing with the question similarly. Mm. I and mean, it's really an interesting question, right? Can 
if, if color is sending all these different signals, if red means stop and red means red light district and red means commies and red means red states and all these other different things and, and lots of sports teams too, right? Can it also have trademark meaning? Um, we thought that was just a really interesting question to ask. And if it can, well, should that be a registered trademark that one entity can own nationally in a particular business sector? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So in the paper, you, you generate two different data sets that, that you study, the first of which goes to sort of the meanings that people associate with, with colors. So I, I wonder if you could describe that, that first study, sort of what you were looking to identify and what kind of findings you were initially able to draw from that study. Right. So... Um- it's interesting that the, there have not been many studies of color, right, at all. Um, and in particular, studies of, about how consumers use color. We know from a branding pr- pr- perspective, from marketing, we assume that consumers are using color to identify products, to to associate products with particular qualities, but there had not really been a study to show that. And so we took a a survey of about a thousand consumers um, and asked them some simple questions, starting with their favorite color and then moving more into how they use colors to identify brands when shopping, when shopping online. And what we found was, interestingly, first, that that one's favorite color, blue, is not necessarily a color that is associated with qualities like high quality luxury, right? Things like um, gold or black pop much more um, in those um uh, uh, context, right? So, so those colors have a certain meaning. Also, we found that consumers, um, mo- most consumers are using colors to identify brands, not only while, while shopping uh, in a store, also online. Um, and so that that was very interesting. Um, uh, men do not do that as much as women, but both do that. Mm-hmm. So, so it's pretty clear from your study findings then that that colors are communicating information in a con- in a commercial context that either helps or influences maybe consumers in their purchasing decisions. Yes, absolutely. Right, right. Okay. Well, so, so kind of taking that observation, right? How does how does trademark law conceptualize trademark protection in in colors? In other words, like what is a what is a color mark, and what does the trademark office expect an applicant to show in order to claim? a registration of a color mark? Well, there, the, this is part of the reason the Qualitex decision was so important because it was the case that first decided that color alone could serve as a mark. And there was really some doubt about that prior to that Supreme Court decision. And it basically set up two gatekeeping devices. One is the aesthetic functionality doctrine which basically says that if color is serving a purpose that is not reputational, if it is expressing something else, then it cannot be protected as a mark because competitors will need to use it. So for example, nobody can have a monopoly in red for things that are strawberry flavored or cherry flavored because that is not sending a trademark signal in the, in those contexts. It is sending a, a signal of, of flavor. Right. And competitors would be terribly disadvantaged if they couldn't use the flavor of red for things that consumers expect to be red colored. Okay, so that's the functionality doctrine. Um, The second is secondary meaning. So there is a subset of 
subject matter that can become a trademark that can't automatically be protected as a trademark. You have to demonstrate through consumer recognition or exclusive use that people actually recognize that symbol as a trademark. So for example, descriptive words cannot be registered as trademark unless you've used them exclusively for a number of years or have some other evidence that consumers recognize them as, as a trademark. Same with color, because uh, the court in Qualitex indicated that color is so often used um, aesthetically or just as mere decoration that they require a showing of secondary meaning. So a great example of this is Tiffany's Robin's Egg Blue, right? We all, through all their um, very thoughtful and artistic marketing efforts, have done an amazing job at getting consumers to associate that brand and specific brand values with that particular hue of blue. But that is a really heavy burden. And it people generally predicted, or even the Qualitex court seemed to suggest that functionality would be the primary mechanism for sorting out anti-competitive uses. But it turns out we found in our study that actually it was secondary meaning that seems to be doing much of the gatekeeping work, at least in, in terms of registering marks with the USPTO. Mm. So, so maybe you could delve a little bit more into the functionality and secondary meaning concepts in relation to the Qualitex case, which it seems like is still providing the primary kind of source of guidance for lower courts and for, for the trademark office. Sort of how did the Supreme Court conceptualize and describe those two requirements in relation to the particular product in question and sort of what, what was at stake there? Well, really what was at stake was the possibility of competing, right? The idea was that one needed, if, if one could show that um, something perhaps would be more expensive to create in um, a different color or if adding a color would require um, some sort of extra expenditure, then that would be a really tough anti-competitive effect. And so courts basically developed this standard that if, if the product feature was essential to the use or purpose of the article, or if it affects the cost or the quality of the article, then it would be deemed functional. Um, and what the Qualitex basically added to that is that also if it was serving that, that you could still, um, even if something was a really important ingredient in the appeal of a product, if it was reputation related, it could be re uh, protected. But if it was not reputation um, related, then others could get to use it. So that was basically what it added to the mm. Mm. So the Qualitex case, I mean, it involved a, a dry cleaning pad, but ironically, one in a color that would normally be seen as consumed by consumers as quite unappealing. This kind of, they describe it as like green gold, but I mean, I, I can't stay away from like basically puke green. The word that comes to mind immediately, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. And, and I've, I've been told by people in the know that, you know, that is indeed a really distinctive color with respect to Qualitex's product line and that it does like kind of for the relevant consumers communicate, you know, this is a Qualitex product. But the question that always bothered me about the case and that you sort of discussed briefly in the paper was the question of, of functionality and what that means in that context. Because as you point out in the paper, I mean, at least one of the reasons for choosing that particular color was that it would help kind of mask stains and other kinds of dirt that might be on the product in question. Why wasn't that functional? And, or is it, you know, is there an argument that it was like sort of how should we think about functionality when it comes to why a particular color choice is made? And is it simply enough that there were other colors that could accomplish the same function? That's basically it, right? If, if, if 
some color is needed in order to do that job of masking the staining, but it could be any color and our eyes can perceive millions of colors. Why did the competitor choose this particular puke colored green? Because that was what it's the leading competitor was using. And so if there are plenty of other colors available to a competitor, then the functionality doctrine um, is not a bar, but if you have to use a particular color. So one one example for is that let's say you are selling bows to go with violins and cellos that are used in orchestras and violas, right? We can't leave out the violas. If you try to get a monopoly in black or brown for bows for stringed instruments, the functionality doctrine is going to block you. Because those are the colors that are that signal the materials that the bows are made with. Either they're going to be carbon fiber and, and hence black, or some sort of wood and then some shade of brown, right? And so it's essential to the purpose of 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 and, and being connected with the particular products that these materials are made of and that consumers see what that is, right? That they be in those colors. Also, they have to match the rest of the orchestra, right? So somebody would be at a terrible um, non-reputation related disadvantage. That's the third Qualitex problem. If they were forced to spend extra money to make their bows a different color other than black and brown. See what I'm saying? So you know, yes, you can still sell those and reds in lots of different colors, but nobody is going to get a monopoly on those particular colors, brown and black, because those are what we expect to see in the industry. It would put others at a disadvantage and force them to spend extra money. Mm. And you, you, I feel like you talk about that to some degree in the paper in relation to the pharmaceutical uh, color uses, where it's like, particular color pills communicate information about what the contents of the pill are to consumers. And it made me think of like going to the grocery store to buy like a sweetener, right? Where like different kinds of sweetener come in particular colors, even though, and actually the, like the brand name and the generic version, the store version use, use the same color. Mm -hmm. is, is that a version of the kind of, you know, non-competition related functionality that, that you're talking about there where, you know, if you had to put your sweetener in a color other than the one of the main brand consumers wouldn't know what it is that you're selling. Yeah, it's hard to know in any particular instance. I wonder about this all the time, and it's very distracting to me, especially in a pharmacy, right, where you see the children's Motrin in, in an orange box, and then you see the, um, you know, the CVS or the Walgreens version in exactly the same color box. And I sit there and I wonder what's behind it. Is that a license? Is that something that... Um, you know, is, is there something here that has been worked out and there's been some sort, of, sort of exchange? Yes, you get to use this color, but in exchange for that, we're going to make sure that the font is at least, you know, 36 points. So you differentiate yourself from our word mark, right? There's often, um, there's often some history of litigation when you see some lookalikes like that. Mm. So you did a second empirical study in the paper as well, looking at a, sounds like a really vast data set from <laughs> from the trademark office. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that data set, how you used it, and sort of what you were looking for and what you found. Uh, sure. So, uh, yes, it is a vast set of data. It's about 8 million um, uh, tra trademark filings over, um, in, in total, we have all of the data for about 150 years, 130 years. But we focused on 1987 to 2015 um, primarily um, because Qualitex came out um, in the early 90s, right? And so we wanted about five years pre-Qualitex to get a baseline 
Um, and then to see how those filings, particularly for color applications, looked post Qualitex to see if the concerns about um, sort of, sort of you know, tons of applications and depletion and crowding um, would come to light. Um, and so what we found um, first was that that even though that data um, is 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 maintained by by the PTO, probably um, um, on account of the fact that Qualitex itself was not a foregone conclusion, the PTO does not code for for color applications in a consistent manner. Um, and so a lot of what we had to do was to identify out of the color marks and the design marks, which applications were truly color only and not color in combination with a, a, a text element, a design type of element. Um, and so when, when we first looked at how the PTO had, had coded that data, it looked like there were about 174 applications in that time period, a very small amount. And that didn't seem right. Right. Um, and so what we found, though, is those is that there were in truth about twelve hundred applications. Many of them had been coded as as not only color, but color and a design. But when we looked at the applications and we actually manually looked at each of those applications, we found that those were, in fact, color only. And so based on that coding system, we then compared um, the text only marks and the other types of marks against those color only marks to see how that might affect our rates of publication, et cetera. And so what we found was once color came into the mix, those rates dropped dramatically. Mm. Yeah, I think I, one of the really interesting findings is that what a teeny percentage of, you know, despite the, <laughs> the despite the Supreme Court decision in Qualitex, there is just the tiniest, tiniest sliver of a percentage of marks that claim color. And in and of that tiny segment, and even tinier that claim color alone. So this is a very, very small, underutilized opportunity for trademark. Mm. And do you have any sense of why that is? I mean, is it harder for an applicant to get a registration for a color only mark? Um, do you think maybe there are just kind of business reasons why um, why market participants are not moving to register color only marks? Um, I mean, a a any sense of what could be driving that? One big barrier is secondary meaning. So in order to get protection for a color mark, you have to show that you are engaged in substantially exclusive use in the U.S. And there just aren't a lot of companies that have been using a standard color consistently as a mark in a way that's exclusive. And uh, one thing that actually surprised me is, is how many companies um, tried to get this and failed mm. uh, because it is such a high bar. I mean, even uh, even an organization like um, Harvard or University of Alabama that are really have, have put a lot into the, their versions of COVID, right? Neither of them could ever get those marks registered because they are not exclusive. One of their, what, you know, another big competitor in in higher ed uses the color crimson. So that is a big, that, that is a is something that will prevent even a lot of re relatively famous color marks from ever getting registered with the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Mm -hmm. Because in a sense, the color in that context would communicate information about more than one market participant. And so it wouldn't be singling out any one, any one organization as, as being associated with that color. 
Well, the standard requires uh, for secondary meaning requires substantially exclusive use, and neither can prove that. Now, they could come to an agreement that you know we we each are going to we are going to divide up regions of the United States, but I think there's so many other players in the field, literally, that use the same colors on football mm-hmm. fields that I think it would be very hard even to get that done. Mm. Do you think some of that is a function of the size of the market as well? I mean, I mean, I don't know a whole lot about dry cleaning, but I'm assuming that the number of participants in the dry cleaning pad market is, you know, that's a pretty specialized, <laughs> pretty specialized market. But there's an awful lot of institutions of higher education out there. Do, do, do you have a sense that that different market sectors might be more susceptible to color marks than others? I don't know. It would be an interesting thing for, for future research. I mean, we one thing that we, we definitely did see is that there are color marks in every single category of goods and services on the registry. Uh, and, and in some places, it might surprise you. For example, um, scaffolding. Right, mm. you know, that red scaffold. Every time you pass by red scaffolding, that that, that scaffolding, <laughs> that red is registered as a trademark. Right, pipe, industrial pipe, all kinds of medical devices. Um, it's really interesting the um, the the breadth and the um, diversity of marks that we saw as we we're looking through this. Mm-hmm. So, did the the two empirical studies that you did for this paper? intersect with each other in any ways? Or in other words, did sort of the information Mm -hmm. that you unearthed about consumer preferences related to color and meanings that consumers associate with color Mm -hmm. seem to inform the kinds of decisions that that trademark applicants make with Um, respect to the kind of color choices that they're they're looking at? uh, So yes and no. Um, in terms of uh, what we saw was that blue is the favorite color, right? And blue is also um, the color sought most for trademarks, right? Um, however, there are some there are some colors like purple, for example, that it is a consumer favorite, um, but does not come up he- heavily in trademarks, right? And so those are opportunities, right? Places that a brand man- manager, um, particularly if, if purple um, would indicate something about their good, right? Um, that that could be an uh, um, a place for a brand to, to expand. I would say by and large, many of the colors did map over and indeed, you know, uh, a color like gold, a color like black comes up in certain classes of goods and services quite frequently, right? For jewelry and things uh, and clothing. Um, And so we, we do see some crossover, but it's not it's not one-to-one, right? And so it's very very interesting. interesting. If you look at at, in our, in our um, paper, in the draft to our paper, I know that, you know, in a, in a oral podcast, we don't get the chance to show visuals, but we have a really cool chart that shows, yeah, blue's the favorite, but way, but the percentage of registered marks, one color marks is way low. Their blue is way lower than mm-hmm. how much so it's 20 percent of of one color marks are blue 36 percent of people say blue is their favorite people it we really thought it was interesting that 14 percent of people say that purple is their favorite color yet only four percent um of marks are purple meanwhile pink Right, everybody thinks that women love pink. A very, a, even a smaller percentage of women like pink than purple, and yet there are more pink marks than purple marks. Right, so I think there is some interesting crossover um, data that that people mm. thinking to develop new um, colors and brands might might be interested in looking at. But I, mm. actually, I think one of the one of the most useful um, crossover themes is that. I was really surprised by in those questions that we asked at the beginning, we first started this work, we thought, God, we have to figure out 
are people like really using color to tell, you know, when you walk down the aisle at a grocery, if you're looking for your favorite cereal or, or laundry detergent, are you using color to pick out which box or which bottle it is? And we were stunned at how many consumers said, yes, that is a huge help to them. And even and the, other, the other thing that really surprised me is that even in the online context where, I don't know, when I shop online, I'm usually typing in a textual search. And so I thought that the numbers of people that said color was so helpful to them would drop a lot when we asked about online shopping. But no, people said, no, still color is super helpful to us in selecting brands when we shop. And we just thought that was really, we, there's just an interesting disconnect between how helpful consumers view colors and shopping with the tiny percentage of colors registers as marks. Mm. So earlier in the conversation, you noted both that some scholars have raised concerns about the extension of trademark protection to color marks, especially as sort of the concerns about like aggressive extension in in that context, and also kind of broader concerns um, primarily raised in the text mark context around sort of like clogging up the registry with a thicket of, of marks and so on, and sort of a depletion of available mm -hmm. marks. Do, do your studies and your interpretation of those studies um, support or like or confirm or sort of uh, uh, question those conclusions? Words, get, sh should we be concerned about those problems or do your studies suggest that maybe they haven't really materialized as problems yet and perhaps might not materialize in the future? Well, they're clear, they clearly have not materialized in terms of clutter with color marks. And if you were worried about clutter, and are generally worried about clutter as, as the USPTO itself is very worried having started all kinds of programs for cleaning up the registry. I think we can all be comforted that the United States Patent and Trademark Office is doing a really good job of making sure that only people who are genuinely using color as a mark um, are getting them registered. And that's a good thing, right? It's kind of, it's kind of fun to occasionally see that one branch of our government is, is doing its job well. <laughs> <laughs> what a shock, right? Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast, Deborah and John. I really appreciated uh I really enjoyed your paper and 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 talking to you about it as well. Brian, thank you so much. This has been such a treat. Yeah, it's been great. Thank you. summer clothes. Think pink, think pink if you want that kelp to shows. Red is dead, blue is through, green's obscene, brown's taboo, and there is not the slightest excuse for plum abuse or chartreuse. Think pink, 